Hello, my name is Steve Bubeck. I'm a natural history biologist and entomologist with the Missouri Department of Conservation. I'm here to talk to you today about the reintroduction of the American bearing beetle, Necrophorus americana, in Missouri. You might be familiar with this beetle already from the B movie where it attacked the Vatican and took over. Um, actually, this is an advertisement as part of the Vatican's Endangered Species Program. Uh, so it is a fairly famous beetle, uh, such as that goes, uh, not as famous as Ringo and some of the others. It's a member of the Sylphidae, uh, which is a carrion beetle group, and uh, they're all relying upon carrion beetles. Here we have a male on the left and a female on the right. Uh, the male has more red on the pronotum there. Um, but these beetles are charismatic and were federally listed in 1989 as endangered species. Um, they're one of the largest members of the Sylphidae in the United States. And for reasons we're going to discuss as we go, um, have been going through a lot of the troubles, and thus the reintroduction. So um, they're called bearing beetles because a male and a or a female will actually fly around in the habitat, be that prairie or woodlands, looking for a suitable carcass. The carcass used by American bearing beetles is between 80 and 200 grams in size. So think about the size of a chicken breast, um, a quail, or maybe a hispid cotton rat, they're all about the right size. If the male or the female finds one of these carcasses, uh, they'll actually land on it, start to bury it. They'll dig out underneath, as you can see on the right, they're very proficient diggers, and they'll actually entomb this carcass. And they'll strip it of all the fur and the feathers, and then they'll uh, cover it with anal secretions that prevent it from rotting and, and help entomb the carcass. They lay their eggs on it, and then the young, as you can see on the left, hatch out and proceed to feed on this uh, well-preserved meatball uh, for the next 14 days. Uh, they're unusual among insects and they actually uh, show some parental care. Both the male and the female will occasionally stay down in there in the burial chamber with their young uh, feeding on the same carcass. Uh, sometimes the male will leave as often happens in life and the female is left to do all the work alone, but even that alone is enough as a uh, fairly unusual within the insect world, some form of parental care. Historically, the American bearing beetle ranged across most of the eastern United States. You can see an outlier here in Montana, in Texas, uh, Missouri, kind of in the center there, for those of you not familiar, was well within the core of the range. But we have not documented this species in the wild since 1982, uh, despite extensive surveys uh, in the 80s when this species was first petitioned for listing of the Endangered Species Act and throughout the 90s when we were assessing the possibility of a reintroduction effort, uh, we wanted to make sure we weren't going to be messing with local genetics. So here's the current known distribution of the American burying beetle. Uh, the population in Nebraska is probably considered the most uh, self-sustaining, the strongest uh, population. By the time of listing in 89, the population was actually only known from Block Island off the coast of Rhode Island. So a really uh, significant range reduction. Since federal listing has been discovered in these western populations in Oklahoma and Nebraska. Um, but these populations um, have various threats to them that we'll discuss. Uh, but nobody really knows why this species declined from 90% of its range. Uh, one of the main People think habit, habitat loss and fragmentation. Clearly, a lot of prairie and woodland and forest has been lost throughout the eastern United States over the last 200 years. Um, because they're a, a carcass seeker, because they're a carrion eater, they uh, may have lost prey of optimal size. My personal favorite pet theory on why they've declined is the loss of passenger pigeons. Passenger pigeons were right in that 200, 250 gram range that would be a really good food source. A lot of them raise a lot of healthy large larvae on a, a dead passenger pigeon and those prey decline, uh, the beetle obviously would have followed. Another theory is mesocarnivore release. So as we eliminated large carnivores, things like raccoons, opossum, and this fox here, increased on the landscape, providing a lot of competition for carrion of all sizes. Um, other theories are light pollution, um, an increase in competitors and congeners in the uh, Necrophorus genus competing for resources. Um, there's a lot of other reasons that it could have declined. Regardless, we knew that it had been eliminated from the state and from most of its range. So uh, my predecessors started looking at a captive breeding and reintroduction program. In 2004, um, they started breeding this beetle. And you know, we think of zoos and we think of the outdoor exhibits and 
you know, some big elaborate uh, facilities, but actually these things are bred primarily in five gallon buckets. You can see one here. They drop in the carcass, drop in a mated pair and let them do their work, keeping them just controlling the temperature and humidity. Um, eight years later, we finally had enough burying beetles to start considering the release. And uh, so this would make nine years of American burying beetle releases. So our release site is Wakanta Prairie. Uh, this map is not going to show up today, uh, but it's in southwest Missouri in our unglaciated prairies, unglaciated plains. It's a 3,030 acre uh, prairie owned by the state of Missouri and the Nature Conservancy. And it's actually part of a large complex of other prairies in the region. So we thought here there's a large population of quail, one of the areas where some of these larger birds are doing better. Um, birds that provide suitable sized carcasses when they die. So on the prairie, we'd hand dig a hole uh, like this and put a little bit side chamber in it, tuck the dead quail in there with a mated pair of burying beetles, uh, then recover it and put chicken wire over the top to keep raccoons, foxes, and coyotes out. Over the last uh, eight years now, we've released over a thousand mated and provisioned pairs on the prairie. So that's 2,000 beetles we've released, an average brood size of maybe six to eight. Obviously, there's the potential to have a lot more beetles on the landscape, but there are surveys uh, for most of this time. We're mainly focused on seeing whether these reintroductions were working. So we'd go back two weeks after the reintroduction, uh, run some pitfall traps with baited chicken and see how many beetles came. So we knew that at least the methods we were using to put these mated pairs on the landscape were successful in producing more beetles. What we didn't know is whether these were capable of surviving on the landscape on their own. So in 2016, we started a mark recapture study where we'd run the same baited pitfall traps, um, put a B tag on them and notch the elytra. You can see it here on the upper left of this individual. A little mark in the elytra, letting, in, letting future researchers know that we've caught this uh, individual. Um, they only live about a year, but we have captured individuals that we had marked in previous years. We set up 54 random uh, tessellated stratified pitfall traps across this 3,000 acre prairie and ran three years of mark recapture study, one week um, each in July, June, and August, and uh, baited the traps on Monday and ran the traps until Friday. So that made, gave us about 750 trap nights a year. And this is additive to the 1,000 trap nights a year we were doing to assess the effectiveness of our uh, provisioning. So, some of the interesting things we found as a result of this mark recapture is that the American bearing beetles had actually moved throughout this larger landscape on their own. We found uh, through the course of the mark recapture and associated studies that they had spread about seven kilometers uh, from the initial reintroduction site. So they were starting to you know, occupy a much larger landscape, which is a very good sign. Uh, because we were sampling on a daily basis in the same sites, we did document individuals that would move one point, up to 1.4 kilometers in a single day. So they're capable of moving throughout this landscape relatively easily, even across wooded landscapes. And um, this also shows to, or goes, helps demonstrate that these beetles are not trap averse. If we catch a beetle one, the first day in a trap, we caught the same beetle multiple times. And in fact, showed no difference in trap and trap efficiency between the first day and later in the week. We also documented beetles that would release from one trap and immediately fly to the next trap in the line. So we documented beetles that were able to fly a quarter kilometer in 35 minutes, um, providing some measure of speed movement of these animals across the landscape. So here's the results of our uh, four years essentially of, um, well five years now of of mark recapture. So this is capture rates. You can see again that we stop. Oh, so in, in 2019, we actually moved the reintroductions from Wakanta Prairie where they had been reoccurring up to Taborville Prairie at the north part of the geography. This ensured that um, as we were releasing individuals, we weren't gonna be double counting them on Wakanta and assuming they were part of the long-term population. We wanted to assess the effectiveness of the ability of these animals to survive on the landscape without the reintroduction. So we moved the reintroduction site to the north. So prior to moving that reintroduction site, we saw about two American burying beetles on every sampling or every uh, 
sampling night. After to remove the release out of this geography, that rate effectively halved. You can see here that's statistically significant. Um, 2020, um, due to COVID related concerns, it's a totally different matter. Sampled fewer nights, had fewer people sampling to try to minimize contact and um, found far fewer beetles. We're not certain at this point whether that's a result of our limited effort or an actual population decline. But either way, it's not a very good look going from uh, down to essentially one beetle that we've seen so far this year in our reintroduction site. So we ran some generalized linear models on this information. You can see some of the results here. Um, if you're not adept at reading these models, which I'm not either, essentially what a lot of these are saying is that your initial capture rates and your capture rates later in the season don't change over time. Capture rates between sexes tend to not be significant. Um, basically, the beetles come to rotten chicken. Um, and that's the main driving factor here. But you can see our populations are really crashing. I didn't, again, I didn't throw the 2020 information on here because we simply can't run a population model with only one individual and no recaptures. But a very significant decline in this population, even with uh, population supplementation. And unfortunately, it looks like without ongoing effort, it's going to look even worse. These beetles are not evenly distributed across the landscape. Uh, so this heat map here shows where we've caught beetles over time. And that dark, darkest blue is where we've caught the most beetles. And that also happens to be one of the highest points in the surrounding county. So one of our main theories about where these beetles may be going is that they could be saturating the landscape. We said that they've documented them seven kilometers away from our reintroduction site. Um, we've developed a little bit of an idea of what they prefer in this landscape. So maybe, maybe just maybe, they're spreading out across the landscape and um, because there's no other American bearing beetles, we're seeing a lot lower capture rates than they do in the Oklahoma and Nebraska populations. Carrying availability continues to be a concern. Uh, we spent one summer trying to catch, to do small mammal sampling. Our capture rates were about 10% of what were expected in an average small mammal study, and uh, we got a lot of tick-borne illnesses in that crew, so we actually had to suspend that sampling and have not been able to find the funding to restart it again. We do have bird monitoring going on in the landscape, and this is one of the healthiest populations of bobwhite quail in Missouri, uh, so we know the bat is still an available food source on the landscape. Uh, Meadowlark populations, which are also suitable, are pretty solid on the landscape. So there's at least bird availability. Um, for the future, we're gonna continue to survey at known sites and try to do private land work in this region as well. So we can determine um, you know, if the population truly is crashing or if they're just spreading out due to a lot of available space in the surrounding landscape. So I'd like to thank the Fish and Wildlife Service, the St. Louis Zoo, the Nature Conservancy, all our partners in this work. Um, with this charismatic beetle who we can hope can be around for future volunteers to get to see in the future. Um, all right, well, thank you for watching and uh, attending the Natural Areas Association Conference.